Good evening, all. Welcome to the third day of International Virtual Talk Series on Revisiting English Language and Literature. On behalf of the School of English, Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, I, Dr. Radhika, Associate Professor in English, extend a warm welcome to all the viewers. It's my privilege to welcome the resource person of today's session, Dr. Amrit Sen. Dr. Sen is a professor and head of the department of English at Vishwabharti Shantini Ketan. His areas of interest are 18th century studies, travel writing, Tagore studies, and his history of science, etc. He has published a number of research articles and books on Tagore. To mention a few, uh, Tagore and his circle, the remarkable women of Shantini Ketan, the Scottish Enlightenment, and the Bengal Renaissance. He has translated and performed in Tagore's dance drama at national and international level. At present, he is the joint editor of Vishwabharti Quarterly. He is also a recipient of various awards. To mention a few of his awards, the Outstanding Thesis Award by the Government of India, Research Award by UGC, the Oxford 18th Century Bursary, and many more. He was an invited speaker at University of Oxford and Shanghai University, and he has also delivered a speech on Tagore at uh, Mahatma Gandhi Center, Mauritius. So I have tried to shorten the introduction of Dr. Sen. Uh, today, he is here to speak on the rise of periodical essay in England. Sir, I welcome you uh, again, and the session is yours now. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Radhika, for your very kind words. Uh, Namaskar to everybody. And uh, a very warm to the I would also like to thank the audience, Principal College, for providing me with the opportunity to talk to you about the people in the Why did I talk about this? Why did I decide to talk about uh, I thought that since this college has departments of English and also departments of journalism, and since a lot of people across the globe are watching uh, news right now, one of my trust areas would be to see how this category of news was developed, how it proliferated in England at a particular point of time. I look at how social issues, material conditions provoke news, how news is used for propaganda, how there is fake news. So in a certain way, issues are I think uh, his network is uh, creating issues. Uh, kindly bear with us. Like within two minutes, he might he'll be joining.
dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Application window. Share. Okay. I have unmuted myself. Right? So, should I continue? But here you cannot, um, you can pick up your video and you can just unmute. No? I can hear you here in the phone, but not in that. Yeah, yeah. Is this fine? Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I've talked about the Athenian itch and the rise of the periodical essay in England. My argument being that, you know, the periodical essay was born out of a particular set of historical circumstances. And uh, it was marked by uh, a kind of a hybrid status between news and the novel. So in this particular lecture, I'll also be uh, questioning the category of news itself. Now, this phrase I take from John Dunton, a publisher who will be part of our discussion later on, uh, when Dunton talks about being tainted with the Athenian itch, and news and new things, he says, do the whole world bewitch. So obviously, this is 1690. And John Dunton is talking about a particular time period when news becomes a very important aspect of, uh, of literature, as it were. Now, these are my research questions. What were the antecedents? of the periodical essay in England. Uh, what were the material conditions of its proliferation? What were its features? How did the age problematize the issue of uh, news? What were the phases of its development? How did it approach language? How did it con contribute to the formation of the public sphere, civil society? And how did it contribute to the novel declining in and around 1760? So a time period between 1690 and 1760 is the time when the periodical essay comes into prominence. Therefore. My question being, how did, why did it rise? What did it tackle? And 
where exactly, why exactly did it decline? Let me move on to the next slide. And I talk about the, uh, I talk about the concept of news itself. How did this concept of news, especially in print, originate? Uh, I take you back to the Roman times when we talk about the acta diurna or the daily acts of ancient Rome, uh, which were actually postings of announcements of political and social events. So this was a daily gazette dating before 59 BCE and very often are attributed uh, to Julius Caesar. The handwritten copies of news, therefore, were posted in prominent places in Rome and talked not only about the edicts of the Senate, but also talked about sport, gladiatorial con contests, astrological omens, notable marriages, births and deaths, public appointments, and trials and executions. Therefore, a lot of military news was compounded with a lot of everyday news, as it were. And therefore, this becomes one of the first of its kind in the sense that news for public consumption is broadcast in public places. Uh, now, from, if you move on from the classical times to the more medieval times, we encounter what we will call the news sheets instead of the newspaper. The major difference being that the news sheet was published irregularly on particular occasions, unlike the newspaper. And this is where we come across the term Gazette in the early modern era. Uh, the new sheet was handwritten by official scribes, read aloud by town criers. So there were people who announced the news. Uh, the Venetian Republic, in fact, was, was one of the first to charge one Gazetta for public readings. And therefore, you have this word Gazette, which we very often refer to coming from this Italian concept of the news. And this is also the first occasion, really, when there is, in effect, a rich commercial demand for news, even on the part of the illiterate uh, population, as it were. Therefore, this is the early modern period. Now, what were the new sheets? Uh, called. The other popular name for the new sheet would be the Mercury. Now, the Mercurius Gallobelicus was one of the earliest of the number of periodical summaries which came into Europe approximately around the late uh, 16th century. You'll remember that it's the late 15th century when print becomes uh, prominent in society. And you have terms like Mercury, Herald, and Express, which uh, become associated with documents of news. Now, Mercury, Her Mercury obviously being, you know, the messenger of the gods. Therefore, the analogy with the classical uh, concept of truth the other terms used were observer, guardian, standard, and Argus. Argus, once again, a vigilant watcher. Therefore, this very concept of watching, looking at, observing, becomes important in the category of news. The English news sheets almost always uh, related to a single topical event such as a battle or a disaster or a public celebration. And uh, these new sheets were often used with ballads and broadsides. So 
we don't yet have a fixed category of the newspaper that is regular. Now, the continent sees the first newspapers approximately around 1620. You had the Dutch Corantos or the currents of news. Please remember that the first daily English newspaper was called the Daily Courant. So it took the origin or the name from the Dutch Corantos or currents of news. But the primary newspaper, the primary source of the newspaper was Germany. 1609, as you can see, uh, it's the Avisa Relation Orders Zitung. Uh, Zitung is the a German word for newspaper. The first English Corantos appear in 1621, but the first English daily newspaper, incidentally published by a woman publisher, very interesting that the first English newspaper was published by a woman. And this is the Daily Courant, which uh, went off from 1702 to 1735, so that's not a not a, a non-remarkable event in the sense that the newspaper sort of lived for that long. You have the Times coming up in 1785, the Observer founded in 1791. This is the English newspaper. Here's a picture of the Daily Courant. In fact, it is reporting a military news, as it were, but a very interesting fact an aspect of the newspaper from its very inception, if you follow my cursor here, is the advertisement. So news was always associated with proliferation. And proliferation was always associated with commercial possibilities. And therefore, the newspaper and the advertisement, as it were, went hand in hand. Now, let me now talk about the contexts in which news and the periodical essay becomes so very important. What were the material conditions for this proliferation? Now, this is related, as I point out, to specific changes in politics, law, and publishing practices. Now, the first thing that you have to look at is the civil war and the party-colored mind. You see, between 1625 to 1660, England was under the throes of tremendous uh, conflict between the parliamentarians and the royalists. There was a civil war and news sheets, newspapers, broadcasts were made by almost both parties on a daily basis. Very importantly, therefore, there was a lot of political gossip news that the people thrived on. So. And this is also the time when the parliamentarians brought out their own mercury, new sheet. The royalists brought out their own mercury or their new sheets. So there was a lot of propaganda which was also associated with news. The next part comes in an around 1690s when you have the lapsing of this licensing act. And you also have throughout the decade major writers talking about the freedom of the press. Also important is the rise of parliamentary democracy. Remember that Voltaire calls England the seat of liberty. There's a very robust public sphere, discussions in coffee houses, a thriving cheap print culture. Remember your Mac Fecno, where Dryden talks about Grub Street. Not only is it robust, it is extremely cheap and therefore accessible to the reading public. And there's an exponential growth of literacy and reading public. Male literacy goes up by almost 200%. Female literacy, this is very interesting statistic, goes up by 400%. So you suddenly have a lot of people able to read. And they're clamoring for not classical readings, but daily occurrences. So news steps in to fill that void. There's a rise of the middle class. So there's 
money available to the people, a demand, therefore, to consume news, because these are people who are thriving off contemporary events. This colonization, sudden broadening of the horizon, so newspapers are also seen as you know, sources of advertisements, opportunities, jobs, products that are being brought in from the colonies. Very important is the penny post. So the postal system through which the newspaper could be you know, transmitted from one place to the other. Turnstiles, this would be the build operator transfer system of roads whereby you know, journeys could be cut short. Earlier, you could send a newspaper from, uh, say, London to Newcastle in three days. By 1700, you could send it in 24 hours. News, you will remember, is not news if it is stale. So important roads and very important that penny university where you could enter for a penny and take part in public discussions. That is the rise of the coffee house. The coffee house, remember, is the seat where people merge, mingle all classes. Very importantly, to listen to major figures. There are specific coffee houses for specific political parties. There's coffee houses for traders. For example, Lloyd's, which is now an insurance company, was actually a coffee house. And then it sort of began as a kind of a conglomerate of the shipping agents who used to meet in that particular coffee house. There's an exponential growth of trade, consumption, and along with it, the demand of, for advertisement. So we are looking at a huge flux that provoked a certain material demand for news and a condition for the circulation and cheapness of that news sheet and the periodical essay. This we will have to remember. Now, once again, what we now know as news, of course, again, please, we'll all take news with a pinch of salt, news as truth, was not something which the 18th century looked at. It looked at a kind of an amorphous matrix of new writing. So it could be religious autobiography. It could be pornography. It could be scandal sheets. It could be, you know, criminal biographies. It could be prostitutes biographies. These were called whore biographies. It could be called novels. And very frequently, you know, these were merged into each other. For example, Defoe was writing about a, a real life prostitute. At the same time, he was putting this into his fiction. And therefore, we are encountering what Leonard J. Davis calls factual fictions and a discourse which we will call news slash novels discourse. News being true, novels being false. But at this point of time, news and novels merge together. And therefore, Davis calls this uh, an insistence on recentness as well as factuality and a decrease of the perpetual distance between the reader and the text. And this particularly answers the needs of the lower classes to be informed about public events. So public events, public personalities become much more accessible, as it were, to the reading public. And this is where news, false news, fake news, all kind of merge together. Now, that has not changed, by the way, as you can observe right now, where half of the news might actually turn out to be propaganda and novel, in that sense of the term that novels is falsehood. But very importantly, this leads to the critical category called the public sphere. The coffee house, the newspaper, the periodical essay together create what Jürgen Habermas calls the public sphere, conceptually located between the private sphere of family and authoritative sphere of the state, where art and literature could be discussed, but also it becomes 
a place where even politics and affairs of the state become staple for public discussion. And therefore, public opinion as a political force develops. This, there are elections. There is the concept of the habeas corpus, the freedom of the self. You cannot be arrested just like that without a warrant. And you have an animated atmosphere for conversation and exchange. Remember, it is at this point of time that Voltaire comes to England and he is jubilant at this, at liberty, attaining a seat in the English Commonwealth. This is what the public sphere looks like, the early public sphere, according to Jürgen Habermas. Habermas contrasts this with earlier situations where you had a representative publicness. What was this representative publicness? that it was embodied in the body of the king and the queen. And therefore, there was no public involved in that sense of the term. And therefore, Habermas defined this new public sphere as much as this medium of political confrontation, peculiar and without historical precedent, people's public use of reason. I will remember Count his essay on the light. Count talks about free and public use of reason. The concept of caring not as the basic feature of the enlightenment. And Count says we have the enlightenment, but we are in this process where we are, we are questioning dogma day in, day out. That is what the is one thing. I'm sorry to be from the and connect. Okay, I can see the chat right now. So let me know on the chat. Am I on? Marvel now? No. No. <laughs> About the network, the, um,
okay let me what i'll do is i'll, I'll switch off the airtel now and i'll try the geo hear me okay can you see the uh, see the screen that i'm sharing uh, sir we are not able to hear your voice no, it's breaking, sir. It's your voice is breaking. Now, is this better? Yeah, yeah, better, 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 please. Better. So, should I continue? Yeah, please, please continue. Right. Uh, I'm sorry for all these. Uh, I, I think again, again, the voice is breaking. Again, your voice is breaking. Okay, then let me try a different network. Otherwise, you know, uh, we can't really connect. Now your voice is better. So like, I'll come back. Uh, it's, it's smooth. It's smooth. Okay. So uh, yeah, no, do good. I go on here? Yeah? yeah, you just continue. I... So like we can con continue. So continue. Right. Uh, OK, so uh, apologies once again for the glitch. But uh, I was talking about the, the institutions that led to the rise of uh, the, the periodical essay, as it were. And uh, this would be the coffee house, as it were, uh, which had the freedom from and the freedom from censorship. Uh, now, the famous coffee houses of London, you see, uh, in the 1670s and the 1680s were places where people could meet and uh, where tradesmen and gentlemen across different uh, classes could meet and discuss matters of public interest. But even before the spread of uh, the coffee houses, what was very important was this demand for the removal of censorship. because. After all, 
the greatest impediment for the free circulation of news would be censorship. And the figure here is John Milton and his text of Areopagitica. Now, Areopagitica, uh, written as a pamphlet to parliament, was primarily built on a classical argument that the Areopagus, the hill, hill of Eris, as it were, becomes a seat of freedom and free discourse. And Milton himself is like the Isocrates, who establishes himself as a private man entering the public sphere to address the parliament and commonwealth on matters of public import. So this is the first real voice of freedom from censorship coming in between, uh, say, 16. 1660. Now, the Glorious Revolution, of course, comes next, 1688 uh, to 89. And then you have the starting of the, uh, of the publishing laws and the first provincial uh, presses. And this is the time when the periodical essay comes into being. Now, I have divided this into th three periods. The first is the beginning of the periodical essay, starts approximately around 1691 with Dunton's Athenian Gazette. The more radical departure is seen in the middle of the, in the beginnings of the century with Daniel Defoe's The Review. If you note the date 1704 to 1713, the longest running, as it were, periodical essay. The most famous of them, 1709 to 11, and later on 1711 and 12, is The Tatler and the Spectator, Addison and Steele. And then through, say, people like Fielding and Dr. Johnson, it moves towards its end in Goldsmith's B, which is dated 1759. So I'm talking about a very short period. 1691 to 1759. Uh, once again, the coffee house becomes this place where the periodical essays are very often put up. So readership in increases because the periodical essay is displayed on the coffee house. So the coffee house is a kind of an advertisement board for the periodical essay itself. What was the audience like? Now, the audience is very interesting. The audience is educated, but not extremely learned. There are lots of people who are coming in, traders, common people, aristocrats, and so on and so forth. Very often, these are youngish and female. You'll remember that this, therefore, is one of the reasons that the periodical essay will forever talk about the female readership. And all these essays are somewhere dedicated towards the correction of the English language. Remember that all of these writers were established novelists. And very importantly, many of them wanted to write dictionaries. Johnson, in fact, actually wrote dictionaries. So the periodical essay is not only trying to sort of cir uh, circulate news, it is also trying, in a certain way, to, uh, to improve the English language. What are the features of the periodical essay? Uh, regular and frequent appearance. Most of these uh, essays were published thrice a week. Very few were published daily, only the spectator. Uh, there was a particular point of view, very often political, of the writer. This is Defoe. There's a correspondence with readers, a very important aspect where the readership was, as it were, drawn into the process of writing. So we have what is called participatory journalism. Very importantly, also tied to political movements. But it is marked by a departure from partisan politics and to a circulation of more inclusive opinions. So the periodical essay was consciously trying to bridge political gaps. 
Uh, the periodical essay is also very importantly a uh, participant in the process through which the professional writer moves from patronage to independence. You will all remember that it is 1755 when Dr. Johnson writes his letter to Lord Chesterfield and thereby ends the system of patronage. This is where you actually have a republic of letters addressing the actual political republic. Now, the first essay, the first periodical is the Athenian Gazette or the Athenian Mercury, published by a man called John Dunton. And Dunton's periodical is a kind of a conversation between readers and authors. Readers would post questions on contemporary issues. And Dunton said, the Athenian society of learned men would answer these queries. If you had, apart from Dunton, Richard Salt, the mathematician, uh, John Norris, Samuel Wesley. So it was all kind of fictional. There was no great body of learned men. Dunton was actually responding to all these queries. And they also talked about many fold scandals of contemporary society. What were these questions like? The questions would be like whether the soul is eternal. So this would be a religious kind of a question. Uh, whether the Negroes shall rise. So at the last day, please excuse my usage of the word that is Dunton writing. Whether people do not marry too young. Whether the married state is happy. Whether it is is proper for women to be learned? Very important question that was bugging the contemporary period. And Dunton found that questions in women were so powerful that the first Tuesday of every month would be devoted to questions only about women. Right. So here is the first picture of the Athenian Mercury. Right. Remember March. 1691, this is particularly dated. Here is the man himself, John Dunton, starting a whole new revolution in print culture. And he, here, incidentally, is a picture of the Athenian society as site. And Dunton was looking at, and you can see on the top, this gathering of apparently learned men who were serving the common population who were looking up for news and advice. But in reality, it was all fake. There was no great board to answer their questions. So the question of fake news, fake presentation, is made right at the beginning of the generation of news itself. Ask this very interesting picture also of another Mercury published by Dunton. And this is the ladies' market. Right. This uh, was a Mercury which was solely dedicated to the women. And in this film, principally because the question of whether women give education was one of the most important issues in the field. make the world many. So news and together, and we have the means, what I will call
Yes, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is okay. You can just speak. Right. So give me the go ahead when you want me to speak. You can, you can go ahead. Right. I'm sorry for uh, all these technical glitches, and I'll not therefore go on to the PPT. I'll just uh, rush through the presentation, and then maybe we can discuss what I was trying to do in the question and answers. Uh, so, what DFO does is primarily talk about uh, uh, news and scandal as coming together in the form of the tabloid. And uh, what he also does is brings in the more empirical language of the newspaper into the, he brings in the more empirical uh, language of the newspaper into uh, the periodical essay as it is. Therefore, Defoe's review is probably the closest that we have uh, is the closest that we have to the newspaper in its approach. Mm. Am I audible, by the way? Am I audible? Can you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can go ahead. You can go ahead. Yeah, yes, I can go ahead. Okay. We can okay. hear you. Yeah. Okay. Right. So uh, then comes also another issue that Defo brings into the newspaper is the issue of trade and commerce. And this is where the periodical essay reaches a kind of a new zenith in the way it discusses economic issues within, uh, within the space of the periodical essay, just providing us an idea of how important the, the concept of, uh, the, the, of trade is becoming gradually, replacing other affairs of the state. So politics is gradually replaced by trade and commerce. Uh, the next turn in the periodical essay comes through, reach, uh, reach, uh, through Addison and Steele and the publication of the Tatler. Now, the Tatler uses a fictional, what we have called an idolon or a surrogate uh, mm, sort of uh, surrogate narrator who uses the space to altogether not talk about news itself, but about contemporary social affairs, not political affairs, but social affairs. For example, how should ladies dress? For example, how should one get rid of superstitions? All these become the staple of the tattler and later on the spectator. So Addison's motto is that from, he draws from Juvenal and he says, whatever mankind does is grist for our mill. So anything that is social becomes part and parcel of the spectator papers. Uh, this can be all accounts of gallantry, discussions on poetry, discussions on learning, foreign and domestic news, and whatever else is on the subject matter. Now, the Spectator begins its run from 1711 and is published throughout daily almost for one and a half years. So 555 issues. And in the Spectator, Addison uses what we'll call a Spectator Club, which comprises of Sir Roger de Coverley, uh, uh, an aristocrat, Sir Andrew Freeport, who's a merchant and who calls the sea the British common, Will Honeycomb, an old restoration rake, Captain Sentry, and a silent clergyman. So a cross-section of society debating issues of society itself. And then what is Addison's aim? Addison says that he will enliven morality with wit and temper wit with morality and bring philosophy out of closets and libraries, schools and colleges to dwell among clubs and assemblies at tea tables and in coffee houses. So Addison is, as it were, trying to bring out classical learning and make it palatable and acceptable to the masses at large. 
Now, this, remember, is something that the novel will also try to do in certain ways to formulate a language whereby, you know, the affairs of public behavior, civil society as we know it, will become accessible to the people at large. Uh, what is the readership like? Addison acknowledges that he is publishing 3,000 copies of The Spectator. And he's saying that every, every copy, every 3,000 copy is read by almost 20 people in the coffee house. So you actually have 60,000 people reading The Spectator. The total literate population of London is approximately around a lakh. Therefore, you actually have a vast majority of the people reading The Spectator. And this makes it uh, one of the most important markers and formulators of taste during this period. And what this does, and what I'm trying to draw your attention to, is the fact that the periodical essay remains, therefore, the first print medium to try and modulate, control, and manipulate public opinion to create a system of civil society, civil discourse in a language that was accessible to the people. Often it created characters and therefore it emerged also as a forerunner to the novel. The periodical essay was often referred to as the proto-novel, as it were. Uh, very importantly, Addison also talks about the female readership. And Dr. Johnson referred to Addison's middle style. I just quote this uh, for a moment. Whoever wishes to attain an English style, uh, Johnson wrote, familiar but not coarse, elegant but not ostentatious, must give his days and nights to the volumes of Addison. So it's very interesting. Addison is formulating a kind of an idea about what the ideal English prose would be like for the rest of the century. The next figure on our list, whom I'll very briefly mention, is Henry Fielding. And Fielding is writing several periodicals. The Champion, uh, he wrote The True Patriot and the Jacobites Journal to influence people against the Jacobites during the 1745 rebellion. And he also wrote uh, another periodical called the Covent Garden Journal. And this is 1752. So Fielding is again writing uh, the periodical primarily for issues about uh, general statecraft and politics. But the person who once again returns the, the, the periodical to matters of taste and literature is Samuel Johnson with his Rambler, 1750 to 1752, appearing twice daily for 204 issues. And it is here that Addison, I'm sorry, Johnson is talking about issues like uh, poetry, issues like the dictionary, issues like the pleasures of the imagination. Therefore, uh, Dr. Johnson's paper, The Rambler, is therefore completely dedicated towards literature and culture. Now, the next and the final journal that I'm going to talk about, the periodical essay, is Goldsmith's B. Now, B is published approximately around 1759, but a very important factor remains that it is printed on two octavo sheets. So it's no longer, you know, a periodical of four papers, you know, four sides of the paper, but it is now on 32 pages. And it contains essays, poems, translations, comments, editorials, and is therefore not just a periodical essay, but it becomes an actual magazine. And this is where I would say the format of the B becomes so popular that henceforth 
the periodical essay, as it were, dies away. So the occasional paper dies away and gradually is replaced by the weekly or the fortnightly magazine. So on the one hand, you have the established newspaper serving news every day, and you have the opinions which are published in the magazine with entertainment, with letters from the readers, and with other sundry material. So for a very brief period then, the periodical essay made its appearance, 1690 to 1750. We're talking about approximately 70, 60, 70 years. It arose due to certain material conditions, political debates, rise of a new society without censorship, and a very cheap printing press. It problematized the news novel discourse, talked about how news could be bridged with propaganda, how news could be faked, but also created a bond between the reader and the writer. It created a kind of a space where the reader could question and make his opinion felt. It created a situation where news was seen as propaganda and news was seen as conditioning social taste. It, sh it showed a gradual development and continually emerged through this period. And within this variety, by problematizing this category of news, whether news was true or false, whether news was consumed or news was impartial, how news could become a mode of revenue through advertisements, through all these ways. Therefore, the periodical essay actually acted as this bridge between news and the novel, and it also led and contributed significantly to the rise of a vibrant public sphere in England during this period. It is with this, these comments, therefore, that I bring my discussion to a close. Uh, I apologize once again for the disturbances caused because of the network. Uh, and I hope that if there are any questions, I'll be able to take them uh, in the time that is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Uh, you gave an elaborate deliberation on periodical essays. And uh, it was really informative, which took us back to the days that we learned about periodical essays. So we have few questions from the participants. Right. Yeah. The first question is by Mr. Raghavendra Prasad. And his question is, what is your view on fanatism towards parties and actors in the present era? What I is repeat my, the I question, repeat question, sir. Repeat that question what is hmm? your view on fan yeah. fanatism? What is your view on fanatism towards parties towards parties and actors in the present era. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Raghavendra, for your question. Uh, you see, uh, I, I think that the present age is almost like the past in the sense that, you know, Addison once referred to the, uh, to the age as a party, as having a party colored mind, as it were, uh, in the sense that, you know, everybody was opinionated very, in, in, in certain ways or the other. But personally, I would suggest that, you know, Addison's text remains so valuable, principally because it tried to create what he called a strict neutrality and a meeting place where the fanatic opinions or extreme opinions could be debated and there would be a civil kind of resolution of such conflicts. So personally speaking, I rate the spectator papers and the other periodical essays for the creation of a middle ground where fanatic opinions could be debated and discussed. 
But what has happened with, you know, another medium coming in, the social media, for example, and the relentless, you know, uh, chatter of news channels, as it were, which harp on one particular view, news has percolated into opinion and propaganda to such an extent that our positions are also becoming very rigid. Now, it is here that I would say that going back to the periodical essay and the way in which it tried to create civil conversation could be a way out of this process. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Mr. Ram Kumar Rakesh. And his question is, it was a great time in 18th century in England that Joseph Addison, Richard Goldsmith, and many others contributed to the rise of periodicals. Now, how to relate it in Indian context? Uh, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, had I had a little bit of time, I would have talked about this. Now, you see, English print culture is mirrored very importantly in the Indian contexts when print comes to India in the early half of the 19th century. And you have, therefore, the circulation and debates about uh, between the traditionalists and the uh, reformists on the one hand. And you also have the robust uh, incorporation of the people within these debates. Think about the, about the, about the um, periodical essays and newspapers of the period. You have in Bengal, for example, I have the Probashi, where uh, Rabindranath writes, where other major scientists, authors, politicians all contribute. You have Raja Ramon Roy, for example, using the print space in many of his tracts to talk against the Sati, uh, in the process of Sati, for example. So we are looking at the Indian context, which is using the print public sphere to uh, create its elements of public debate about Indian society on the one hand, and on the other hand, in the regional local presses, you have movements on nationalism. That's true also of the English newspapers of the period, English periodicals of the period. The modern review would be one such example. But in the Indian context, it is used for the nationalists on the one hand. It is used also to critique social tensions within you know, caste systems, the process of sati. So there are two critiques, as I see in the Indian context, one against the British and the other against our society itself. And I think that has been the lar largely the role of the Indian periodical press throughout its, uh, you know, movement. As of now, you have periodicals branched out into different areas. For example, there are political uh, uh, periodicals, you have literary periodicals, but all of them have you know, performed a critical function as the periodical essays of that period did. Thank you, sir. I'll move on to the next question from Ms. Smitha. How did the periodical essay contribute to the standard of English language? Yes, this was how what I was trying to point out before technology interrupted me. You see, you had an English that was either, prior to the periodical essay, it was either extremely learned or it was extremely commonplace. The language of the newspaper was empirical and very often coarse. The language of classical discourse was Latinate and not accessible to a lot of people. So the periodical essay was the bridge which tried to bring the political affairs, social affairs, current news within a kind of, uh, within a kind of a language that would be not too heavy, neither would it be too pedantic. So that is what I would say 
that the periodical essay is trying to do. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's all for the questions, sir. And apart from that, the participants have uh, sent their appreciations. Right. In spite is this of my connection? Am I? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Um. Can participants you? kindly bear with us mm -hmm. can you hear me now yes sir you are audible yeah. I, i'm very sorry for all this uh, problem please excuse my technical goof up i my uh, network betrayed me today. That's okay, sir. We really understand and we thank all the participants because they were so positive in spite of the network glitches that we had. And that's all for the questions. Apart from the questions, they have their word of appreciation for you for your presentation. And uh, a few of the participants have requested you to share your PowerPoint presentation so that whatever they missed, they could go through the presentation and understand from it. So that's all for the questions, uh, sir. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Manjula Bashini to propose. Can I, can I just can I can I just uh, add one something before uh, uh, before she speaks? Uh, I do have sure. you know a YouTube page, which uh, where I post my classes regularly, and this also hosts many of my lectures. So if the participants would be interested in the 18th century, uh, I primarily teach the 18th century in my university. I would welcome them to please come to my page and I am presently discussing the rape of the lock with my students, which is a CBCS uh, text for many of your universities I know. So if any student feels, uh, feels the need, you are very welcome to visit my page and uh, write to me so that I can, I can post my PPT to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this uh, offer, and uh, and I thank Karuna for adding this session to me. And good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Manjula, an associate professor of the Department of English, Murugur College of Liberal Arts and Science. And I consider it my privilege to propose a of thanks today. And for this uh, session on a rise of periodical essay by Professor Sin, uh, Professor and Head of uh, Vishwabharati University. Uh, Dr. Sin, a few things I would like to add here. Uh, most of us, I think the participants, including the participants or teachers of English, and we teach a periodical essay, we just go straight plunge into the 18th century. And your presentation today had so much of depth that it was so much of analysis where it started with the uh, critical circumstances which led to the race of uh, periodical essays the antecedent conditions, the material conditions, and, and the phases of development, what led to the reasons and how it contributed to the society and to the growth of novel, and above all, why did it decline? That's more important, because we just, just plunge into the 18th century periodical essay and we teach Addison and Steve, nothing more or nothing less. So this uh, a particular topic dealt with a periodical essay in Greek, periodical essay in the ancient room, in English literature are so many areas. And my uh, special thanks to uh, my faculty team. Uh, faculty team, I refer to uh, class faculty team. It's not only English department because uh, uh, for the past few days, uh, visual communication department, they give their continuous support to us. And and above all, our management and our principal, Dr. Vigila Kennedy, uh, who is the driving force behind all these endeavors. And uh, without their continuous support and motivation, we cannot do this. And, and my uh, sincere thanks to the participants who understood the technical glitches today and who were very cooperative and who were very patient. They just wanted the content. And that's very much, very much appreciative of the participants also. Uh, I thank everyone once again. Thank you for the support and thank you for the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you.